Good evening. What will be much the most powerful telescope in the world is the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in northern Chile. It's going to use four eight-meter mirrors working together, and the first of these is now in action and sending back amazing results. Look at this picture of a strange galaxy, 15 million light years away. You can see two components there at right angle with each other, so curiously there are very odd rotation effects. And the VLT is also imaged part of the Hubble Deep Space Field. These blobs are in the main galaxies, more than 10,000 million light years away. And you'll see there things that are 4,000 million times fainter than anything you can see with the naked eye. So the outlook for the VLT is very good indeed. Much nearer home, on Hawaii, astronomers have been concentrating upon the star Epsilon Eridani, which is not very hard around, see it with the naked eye. And that's one of our near neighbors, only about 11 light years away, and not too unlike the sun. And around it, they detected a ring of dust, possibly rather like the ring in our own solar system. And it may well be that Epsilon Eridani is the center of a planetary system not unlike ours. There are other stars which shelter dust, but I think Epsilon and Ridney is much the most promising of them. And then, nearer home again, what about the lost solar satellite SOHO? Well, it has been recontacted. We now know just where it is. Will they bring back into action? Well, we're not sure yet, but they are working on it. So let's hope for the best. And now, on to our main theme. We think of the stars as eternal and unchanging. But they are not. Even the constellation patterns do change over sufficient periods of time. Consider Ursa Major, the Great Bear, with the famous seven stars making up the plough. Well, of those stars, five are moving one way and the other two in the opposite direction. So over a long enough period, that pattern will change and eventually we will lose the plough shape altogether because it does take a very long time. But what about the stars? Do they change too? At this stage, welcome back to one of our regular visitors, Professor Chris Kitchen. Welcome back, Chris. Hello, Patrick. What about the stars? Do they change? Yes, indeed they do, and for a whole variety of different reasons. For example, for centuries, it has been known that the star Algol in the constellation of Perseus fades to about a third of its normal brightness at intervals of just under three days. Uh, the credit for the discovery of those changes is normally given to the Italian astronomer Geminiano Montanari back in 1669. But the name Algol actually means demon in Arabic, so it's possible that some suspicion of the changes existed before that. I wonder. At least we know why it happens. Yes, and that was suggested uh, back in 1782 by the English uh, deaf-mute amateur astronomer John Goodrick. He suggested that Algol was actually two stars in orbit around each other, but too far away from us for us to see them as individual stars. Twice in every orbit, one star, as we see it from here on the Earth, would pass in front of the other. Part of the more distant star would then be obscured, and the total brightness would decrease. We call stars like this eclipsing binaries, and we now know many hundreds of examples. This is a part of a Russian catalogue of variable stars, and the listing for uh, eclipsing binaries, as you can see, goes on for many pages with many hundreds of individual examples. It's the Kukalkin catalogue, of course. General catalogue of variable yes. stars, that's right. Uh, the, uh, another well-known example of an eclipsing binary is the bright star in Lyra, uh, the third brightest, in fact, Beta Lyra, which halves in brightness at intervals of about 13 days. But that's another eclipsing binary, not a genuine variable. And there are many stars which are intrinsically variable. Yes, and in fact this whole catalogue, which runs to five or six volumes, contains something like 25,000 individual stars subdivided into 50 or more different types of variable star. Uh, most of those, of course, can only be seen through large telescopes. And in many cases, the change in the brightness is by quite a small amount. But there are some variables whose changes are even more spectacular than those in Algol and Beta Lyra, and which can sometimes be seen with the unaided eye. And that's the group of variables which we call novae. I think that's a mis misleading name, because after all, nova is Latin for new, and a nova isn't a new star at all. No, there are, of course, genuinely new stars, stars that are currently being born, and we can see that happening deep inside interstellar nebulae, such as the Orion Nebula here. Uh, but novae are not just being born. 
Uh, in fact, they are stars towards the ends of their lives. Uh, the reason for the name dates back to before the invention mm. of the telescope. Novi are stars which brighten spectacularly. Uh, at their peak, they can be 10,000 times brighter than before they started to change. We can see here a plot of a typical Nova uh, brightness change. It brightens very, very quickly in a matter of a few days, and then over the next two or three years, more slowly decreases back to its original brightness. Before telescopes were invented, it was therefore possible for a star which uh, normally was too faint to be seen with the naked eye, for that star to become a nova, to brighten, as we have seen, until it becomes visible in the nighttime sky. There would thus be a new star, or Nova Stellarum, uh, visible where no star had been previously. Nowadays, with telescopes, we can often see the star which became a nova after it has faded back to its original brightness. Or indeed, in some cases, we can pick up the star on photographs such as this survey mm -hmm. plate taken on the European Southern yeah. Observatory's Schmidt camera uh, on such photographs as that taken before the nova um, exploded. So novae are not new stars, uh, but the name is stuck, mm. I'm afraid. Well, one thing, if our sun became a nova, it would be rather unfortunate for us, but luckily that can't happen. No, it certainly wouldn't do us any good if it did, and there are a good many uh, science fiction stories based upon the idea of the sun going nova. <laughs> They're great fun, yes. But fortunately they are just science fiction. Uh, we know sufficient about Novi to be certain that the Sun could not become one. There's one very good reason for that. Yes, that's because Novi occur in binary stars, not with singleton stars like the Sun. The Sun does, of course, undergo enormous outbursts and explosions by our human or terrestrial standards, but on a solar or stellar scale, these are still quite small, and nothing the size of a nova explosion could occur on the Sun. No, quite. But of course, um, eclipsing binaries of Algol and Beta Lyrae, they could become novae eventually. They may do so eventually, but it's going to be a long time oh. before they do so, because one of the stars in the binary must be a white dwarf. Uh, so, in fact, the brightest star in the nighttime sky, Sirius, uh, which is a binary system which has a white dwarf as a companion to the bright star that we can see in the sky. There they are together. That's right, and you can see the white dwarf on the right. Yeah. Um, uh, that is the system which, in fact, is much closer to becoming a nova than either Algol or Beta Lyra. If Sirius were to become a nova in the next few years, it would be brighter than the full moon. But, of course, it would remain a star-like source and so it would be visible as a very bright pinpoint of light even during the middle of the daytime. Uh, but Sirius is still quite a long way from becoming a nova. That is because it needs the uh, companion star, the bright star that we can see in the sky, to start evolving off and expanding towards becoming a red giant before the conditions would be right for the nova. It would also help in that case if uh, the two stars were rather closer. Sirius expanding to become a red giant, however, is probably several hundred mi million years off into the future. And so if Sirius does become a nova, it will not do so until the Sun and Sirius have been separated by many hundreds, if not thousands, of light years. And so, rather disappointingly, perhaps we will not see it as bright as the full moon. Well, of course, for a nova, you need a binary system with a red giant and a white dwarf. It seems fairly straightforward, but of course, when the outburst does occur, it's pretty violent. Yes, and it's because of the unusual nature of the material of the white dwarf that the explosion occurs. A typical white dwarf has the same sort of mass as does the sun, but the same sort of size as the Earth. It is therefore enormously compressed. Something like 90 tons of material from the white dwarf would fit into an ordinary sized matchbox here on the Earth. The matter in a white dwarf is called electron degenerate. That doesn't mean to say that it is depraved or corrupt in some way. It's a term used by physicists to mean that the material is behaving very differently from the material we have here on the Earth. The main difference in the behavior is the way in which the pressure no longer depends upon the temperature in electron degenerate material. It only depends upon the density. Why is that so important? because it means that the material behaves completely differently. 
Uh, if the material here on the Earth behaved in a similar way, then one very simple um, consequence would be the suppression of convection. All our weather systems would come to a halt. The Gulf Stream, which eats us warm here in the United Kingdom, would stop. We wouldn't even be able to light fires to keep ourselves warm, because they too depend upon convection. On the other hand, it's possible that we might not need to light fires, because without convection, our body temperatures would probably stabilise at something up towards the temperature of boiling water. Not a nice prospect at all. I'm really glad it can't happen. Let's get back to nova explosion, shall we? Yes, in, in the binary star, the properties of uh, degenerate matter lead to an enormous runaway thermonuclear reaction on the surface of the white dwarf. In a few minutes, half an hour at most, uh, as much energy as the sun would release in a hundred thousand years, maybe even as much as a million years, uh, is produced. Uh, that energy then percolates out from the binary over about the next two or three years and leads to the tremendous increase in brightness of the star in the sky that we call a nova. In order to produce that explosion, the white dwarf must gather material from the companion. Uh, but it can only do that when the companion starts to expand towards a red giant. Most of the time, therefore, the two stars just orbit around each other. And despite the enormous gravitational field of the white dwarf, no material is pulled out from the companion star. But when the companion does start to expand towards the red giant uh, region, uh, it eventually becomes sufficiently large that at the point between the two stars, material is pulled out from the companion down towards the white dwarf. We can see what's happening better if we freeze the orbital motion of the binary system. The material from the companion does not go directly onto the surface of the white dwarf. Instead, it goes into orbit around the white dwarf and forms an accretion disk. Material pulled out later from the companion star then crashes at enormous velocities into the accretion disk. And the impact point, the hot spot, is heated to temperatures of 40 or 50,000 degrees. That's seven or eight times hotter than the sun. And in fact, the hot spot is by far the brightest point in the system, brighter than either of the two stars. And if we see the binary system when it is not uh, undergoing a nova explosion, then in fact, it is the hot spot that we see. Well, what you might imagine of this is that the accretion disk simply goes on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, that's not what actually happens. No, the material in the accretion disk uh, gradually spirals down towards the white dwarf and forms a layer on its surface. The material coming from the companion is largely hydrogen. The white dwarf is largely made up from carbon or oxygen, or in some cases, even iron. Uh, hydrogen, of course, is the uh, fuel for most stars, including the sun. Uh, as in fusion reactions, such as we're familiar with here on the Earth, it is converted into helium. Now, the temperature must be in the region of several millions of degrees uh, before hydrogen can fuse in this uh, manner. But that is still a lot less mm -hmm. than the temperature that would be needed for carbon or oxygen to undergo reactions. As the layer of hydrogen builds up on the surface of the white dwarf, the increasing amount of material slowly increases the temperature and pressure inside it uh, until eventually the temperature reaches the point at which the nuclear reactions can start. Now, as soon as the fusion reactions start, hydrogen converting to helium, enormous amounts of energy are released. That causes the temperature in the layer on the surface of the white dwarf to shoot up. And this is the point at which it's crucial that it is degenerate matter. Because if it were ordinary matter, then as the temperature rose, so would the pressure. And the layer of hydrogen would be blasted off into space. There would be an explosion, but it would be a very tiny one, a damp squib compared with a real nova explosion. But why does the material being degenerate make such a difference? Because in degenerate material, the pressure does not depend upon the temperature. When the reactions start and the temperature rises, therefore, the pressure remains constant. And so the hydrogen layer is not blown off the star. The nuclear reactions, however, do depend upon the temperature. Uh, in fact, they depend very sensitively. If you double the temperature, the rate of the hydrogen fusion reactions goes up by a factor of 100. 
So really, it's um, one thing leads to another. It goes on and on. There's really what we could call a runaway reaction. Yes, and the reaction ends up consuming practically all of the hydrogen layer, fusing it into uh, helium. Um, that causes the temperature to shoot up, and eventually the temperature becomes high enough for the material to stop being degenerate. When that happens, the pressure then shoots up to unimaginable values. And that finally blasts off what is now a helium layer, with a little bit of hydrogen maybe left behind as well, uh, out into space at velocities of up to 2,000 kilometers per second. And that's when we here on the Earth uh, would first start to see a nova. And you can see here um, a nova that occurred some years ago in Cygnus, back in 1976, uh, a before photograph and during the peak of the nova showing just what a difference it does make. I remember that very well. That altered the entire appearance of that part of the sky. And yet, strangely, uh, a nova outburst doesn't destroy the star. No, the stars are hardly affected at all by the explosion. Uh, possibly the material being dragged out from the companion will stop flowing for a short while, but after a year or two, even that will start up again. The binary will then be back where it started. A new layer of hydrogen will start to build up on the surface of the white dwarf, and after a few thousand years, uh, the whole process will repeat itself in another nova explosion. And quite probably, several hundreds of such explosions will occur within the binary uh, before the companion uh, reduces its mass to the point at which it's no longer expanding towards becoming a red giant, and in fact, at that point, will start to collapse down itself to a white dwarf. Only then will the nova explosions come to a halt. But there is in fact a way in which the binary and the stars could be affected by an explosion. And that is if the increasing thickness of the hydrogen layer developing on the white dwarf takes the mass of the white dwarf over about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And that's a critical mass at which the white dwarf will collapse down to a neutron star. In so doing, it will become a supernova. And a supernova emits something like 10,000 times the energy of an ordinary nova. And that is sufficient to blast apart the binary system and send the stars off by themselves around the galaxy. And that's a very different story. After all, supernovae are rare. The last naked eye supernova in our galaxy, seen way back in 1604 when we have another. And come to that, Chris, when are we going to have another ordinary bright nova? It might be tonight, might be next week, it might not be for many years, but when it, when it does appear, it's going to be very interesting indeed. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Don't forget, if you want the latest information, then dial up our Skype my information line, 0891 800 330, or CFAX, page 620. And when I come back next month, I'm going to be on my own this time, and I'm going to talk about the stars of autumn, with special reference to the square of Pegasus. So until next month, good night. <laughs>